doesn't have that sound. Okay, do we wanna go ahead and open up so folks can join since we're set? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, we are going live now. Hello and thank you everyone for joining us today for the first installment of our Smart at Home series, Accessibility 101. We're going to give all of our participants an opportunity to join us. We're gonna go ahead and just give it a moment to let people trickle in. Hello, thank you to everyone for joining us today for the first installment of our Smart at Home series. We're gonna just have a few more moments to let people trickle in. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This is our first installment of our Smart at Home series, Accessibility 101. Before we dive into today's topic, let's go through a little housekeeping. If you'd like to access captions, go to the bottom toolbar and select the CC icon titled Live Transcript, and you'll have access to captioning. Alternatively, you can use the string text link and Megan just drop that into the chat for everybody to use. This is a great option because you can change the font size, font color, or make the captioning full screen. Additionally, when in side-by-side -side gallery view mode, please take note of the slider function in the center of the dividing bar between the slides and the presenter's video. You can grab the divider by the slider and adjust how you view the slides and the presenter's video. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, and we will address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. If you're participating via Facebook Live, you can put them in the comment box and we'll read those also. Throughout the series, prizes will be given out to participants at random throughout, throughout the webinars. So be alert to hear if you won something, as we will redraw if the person drawn doesn't respond to us via chat when we announce. From chat, we'll get your information to send you a prize. We'll be using polls throughout this series to interact with the audience and to collect information we anonymously report to our funders, something we need to do in order to continue providing free resources like this series. I'll actually launch a poll right now to get us started. A poll form will pop up on your screen now and I'll read the poll aloud for accessibility. How do you identify as it relates to joining this webinar? As an individual with a disability, family guardian or authorized representative, representative of education, representative of employment, allied health and rehabilitation, representative of community living, representative of technology or unable to categorize. And then the second question in the poll is what region do you reside as it relates to joining this webinar? Are you living in a metro or urban area or non-metro, more rural area. I'll go ahead and give you guys a few moments to add your answers to the poll.
We still have people trickling in, so I'll keep it open a little bit longer. All right, great. Thank you everybody for joining with that. With all the housekeeping out of the way, let's get onto today's topic. Today's first installment in our Smart at Home series, Smart at Home Accessibility 101, will serve as a foundation for the installments to follow, such as Smart at Home Installation, where our presenter will guide you through the concept of the Internet of Things and how to create that network, particularly, particularly focusing on what options exist for those without steady Wi-Fi access. Or Smart at Home Making It Yours, where we will detail the many features, shortcuts, and routines you can utilize to tailor the way you interact with these devices to suit your specific needs. Our ultimate goal is to demystify the wide and often intimidating world of smart home technology to ensure that members of the disability community know what devices can serve to improve their daily lives and support their independence. By way of a disclaimer, while this technology is beneficial to many people with disabilities, it does also worsen symptoms for those with environmental hypersensitivities. Being cross-disability, we recognize this and want to remind folks to be aware of this when designing accessibility into their homes or those who would do such work with consumers to ensure that home environments are optimal for those home's occupants. And now I'd like to hand it over to today's presenter, Sue Redpenning. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sue Redpenning and I'm an occupational therapist from uh, Minnesota. And I'm going to start us off on Accessibility 101, which is sort of the basics of what you think about when you're creating a smart home. Um, I have a grant in Minnesota, and so I lead a team of occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech therapists, engineers, and assistive technology professionals who go into a person's home that has a disability in our state and really look at Smart homes are one of them, but anything related to assistive technology that the person needs. And we do the assessment in the person's home environment, community or school or work, wherever they're gonna be using the technology. And then we also help to get that put in. Uh, we don't do any of the construction or modification work, but we do all of the um, setup of the equipment, not the tools, but the rest and getting it all to pair together and work together. So I'm presenting based on things that I've learned by mistakes that I've made and assessments and uh, setups that have gone really well and why. So we're gonna go over that today. You can go to the next slide. So in this, we're gonna be talking about what a smart home is and what it needs and how to gather information when you're thinking of creating that in your home or creating that for someone or as a professional, creating that for people that you see. We're also gonna talk about general uh, solutions that you might pick for that smart home and that it meets the overall needs of that person, their environment and future needs. Just like you guys had just mentioned, we need to think of the person's abilities and disabilities and what they're sensitive to because all of those play into what we're going to select. There's multiple things to select from if you know your choices. So you, you don't go in with one solution and expect that to fit the person. You go in to figure out what that home, what that person needs together and make a match. We in our um, program want people to keep using the technology that we select that we can build off of for the future. And we don't want the technology to be abandoned, which is huge in assistive technology. That if the person's technology is not selected appropriately um, or the right training isn't provided, then that person will select to not use that equipment anymore. So we all been in many homes where we see a lot of assistive technology, adaptive technology, adaptive equipment that's in closets, on porches, or in backyards and not being used. So we don't want that. I'm going to also talk about smart home solutions that can be added in the future and how you need to like think of that platform as you want to build off of it from the beginning. 
I also try not to do too much in a smart home right away because there's a learning curve to everything you do. So introducing that in a strategic way for that person and the person's family um, is really important for that to be learned and accepted also. Next slide. The things that um, you wanna consider when you're looking at like the 101 of building a smart home is not just always thinking of the high tech solutions because I think a lot of people and or professionals go there because there's some really cool things that are out there that um, you can do in someone's home. But really you wanna meet that technology need to the person. And oftentimes low tech is the best tech for that person because it meets their needs and it has a, not as large of a learning curve. And a lot of the people that I see in Minnesota, especially in greater Minnesota, the more rural areas, they don't have access to great internet or cell connectivity. Um, and so I'm going to need to pick, if not all low tech solutions, I'm going to pick some high tech in there with low tech. And the low tech might be my backup because they're gonna have some spotty times where it goes up and down. So I think that's one thing that I see people jumping to voice activation or high tech, tech solutions and not really thinking through that, you know, low tech might meet that need of that person and be better received. Training is less and it's very consistent. You need to also learn what the requirements are for the person and or their family or caregivers to learn that solution. Can you provide your PowerPoint to us? Yes, the PowerPoint will be provided to you. So I, I gave it to Catherine and she'll make it available to you. Um, what you wanna do is you want to learn what um, the setup is. So you as a professional or the family member that's going to be setting up the smart home, it's important to do your homework. And I always look at all different types of ratings on technology and what the reviews are saying. And then I get my hands on it and try it and see how it sets up, especially before I'm going to try to set it up in someone's home. I want to know I'm familiar with it. And so, um, you know, if you can, like some states have loan programs or like areas where you can borrow things um, to try. We do that a lot in Minnesota. We have our Minnesota um, equipment loan program here. Um, if I can't borrow stuff, then, you know, I go somewhere where I know that like Best Buy here will let me take things back. If I pick a component that I later does, is not the right one, I can exchange it for another one. You want to be able to know that there's good tech support for any equipment that's picked, whether you're buying it for yourself or, or uh, professionals picking it out, because we as professionals are not going to be there 24-7. So I want to know that the things that I'm setting up have a good tech support the person can call into, remote into, and get, you know, some expertise and so that they know what times they're available to. And then setting up training needs. So each of the smart things that I'll be talking about are ways you set up a smart home. The person or their family do need to be a part of the plan, understand how that technology works, and then to have the right training. And ultimately, I like that person and their family or team to be there setting it up with me. So I talk them through it so that they can physically do most, if not part of it, so that they can troubleshoot it when I'm gone. Because again, we as professionals, part of our job, part of my job as an assistive technology uh, professional and OT is that when I leave that person's home or when I finish my training, that they're also taught how to troubleshoot this so that they're not calling for small things. They can do those themselves. And when I'm setting up like a light bulb, for instance, with Hue, that if that light bulb burns out, they know how to put a new one in and get that paired with their smart home. So it's really important that people understand that or know how to look those directions up if they're doing it themselves. Next slide. So today um, you're gonna learn the importance of matching the person's needs and the environmental factors to select the right type of smart home technology. We're not gonna go into details of all of the smart home options today because you're doing that at a later um, training, but I want you to understand today what things you're gonna be matching and considering and why all that's important. 
I'm also going to talk to you about when you're selecting the smart home options, that there are a variety and they're simple to complex. And the more complex they are, usually it can be a little harder to set them up and it can take a little bit longer to train someone. You will also learn how the environment plays a role in that smart home and understand what types of backup solutions are needed for the smart home technologies. We all know even like smartphones, computers, telephones, everything can go down at some point. And if those items are critical to that person's safety or success in living on their own, I wanna have a backup plan for when those things go down of a low tech solution that can be used when they can't go down. You will also understand what we wanna consider so that the technology continues to be used. So it's not abandoned and abandonment is when someone receives technology and within a couple of months or a year, they stop using it. And it's not because they didn't need it anymore. It can be because the battery stopped working, so like the light bulb burned out, there's troubleshooting that occurred and they weren't able to figure it out. Next slide. So the checklist that I use when I go in and start thinking about smart homes for the basics, is I first want to understand what that person, the family, or the caregiver is telling me that needs to be controlled. Why are they thinking of a smart home solution? And when I do that, I have the person or their family or caregiver describe to me the things that are going well. Because I also want to know, can that person touch things to be able to access them? So if I'm setting up a smart home, if they have a tablet or a phone, can they direct touch to be able to turn things on and off if it's set up on that? Or do they need to use voice to access it or a switch? Or do they have a, um, a Bluetooth wheelchair control that works really well for them? Or do they have a communication device? So I wanna make sure that I take into account all of the ways that that person might wanna control what it is they're lacking in their environment. And then I want to understand also what's successful in their environment because I'm going to use that success because it usually shows me a strength that the person has to help with the smart home things that they need the technology for. I also want on my very basic checklist to talk about tech connectivity and what's available in the home. And you do like, I'm an OT, I'm not an IT person, I'm not a technology person, but I've had to learn some of that and know who my go-tos are because some of the homes I'm going into, it's very vague if we have connectivity or not and if it's spotty or not. And so in my team, I do have engineers and I do have IT people I can ask questions of. And I make sure of that because as I'm learning more, there's still things I don't know about that technology from the back end. So how that's interacting with the home, how that's interacting with what's going on in the outside of where they live, all of those things are important to me, especially if I'm going to pick some higher tech solution. So we can look at internet. So if the person has internet, you can plug in directly to the internet or you can use Wi-Fi if the person has Wi-Fi. Some things can run off a hotspot, but I have to say you have to be careful with hotspots because they don't have a lot of bandwidth. So you might be able to run something small on it. You might be able to run something on it sporadically, but you're not gonna build a whole smart home network on a regular hotspot. You can do some things with Bluetooth. So some people on their uh, wheelchair have Bluetooth connectivity. Some uh, devices connect with Bluetooth. Again, Bluetooth, it has all levels of how great it goes connected and how great it stays connected. So you wanna be careful to look at the ratings when you look at, usually when you look up technology you're thinking about, you can see what people are saying about it. And if you see that the Bluetooth drops a lot, I would not go with that product. Um, you can use Bluetooth for some things and you don't have to use it for everything. So that's another good thing to know. Um, also electricity. So there are um, X10 units and there's units that base off what's going on with electrical activity in the home. Those are older types of technologies, but they're still available. 
and they are more tried and true if you need that type of technology and it's the only thing that'll work. So I still do use some of that, which I'll show you guys in a little bit um, when there's not other choices and it's not expensive. So if it works for somebody, I can still set it up and it's still supported. Um, and then if someone has a landline, some of the things that I'm doing are related to phones. And so I wanna know like if someone has a landline, if they're only using cell connectivity. You wanna know how stable and reliable their home network is. And here's another key that I've learned in the seven years I've been doing this. How many other things are in their home that are running on their network? So a lot of people don't even know. And so you have to go through a list of, you know, is your TV doing anything that's running on your internet network? Are you doing any streaming? Um, it, do you have only cell connectivity in your home? And is any of that running on your Wi-Fi or internet network? Because like me, I, my cell phone doesn't work in my home. I have a very old home. So I'm running my phone on my internet. So I'm using Wi-Fi. So everything that that person or their family or caregivers that live in that home that are running on their Wi-Fi is taking up bandwidth. And sometimes when you count that up with people, it can be 25 things before you even put the smart home in. So you need to know that. You need to know the name of their network, like who their internet provider is and how much bandwidth they have and if they have fiber optics or what they're using. All of that'll help give you as the more lay person, unless you're an IT person that's on here with us and engineers. I, I consider myself a lay person who's learned a lot, but I don't know still that much. So that's why I still reach out and find out more. But for the networks, you need to know um, how reliable they are and how much bandwidth they are. And if someone can tell you who their company is and what they say they're getting, like their upload and download speed, or if they have fiber and how fast it's supposed to be, then you can call them or the person can call them to get some more information about that. And that's very helpful. I've also worked with families, like for instance, I was in Duluth, Minnesota last week and we were working with someone in their family room and we could not even get some apps to download that I was trying to get onto her device to set up the smart home. And her brother came in and said, well, this room has basically no Wi-Fi in it. It's like our dead spot. <laughs> and the mom didn't know that. And so the rest of the home was more connected than that room. And so those are things that you have to know before you start setting, deciding what to set up and where to set it up. And then what the skills of that person who's gonna be using that smart home technology or people that'll be using it is. So can that person physically select items? Do they only need to have like voice access? Is that the only best way for them? Does the person hear, can the person see, and is how, what is the person's sensitivity to things going on in their environment? Not just noise, but electrical sensitivity. I have a lot of people who are very sensitive to electricity running through their home and to computer, um, uh, some computers that are running in their home. And so you need to know that because you don't wanna be adding to that difficulty. And then what are the emergency things that that person needs to be able to access and needs to be able to control. I have a lot of people with very significant disabilities that aren't getting cares at night or getting people to come in at critical times of the day, so they are home alone. And so I need to make sure I know what needs to work and function for that person so they can get help when they need to and that there's a backup plan for it. So that's that dual plan. So those are some of the things I go in with my basic checklist. You'll add more to it. Um, and I do sit down and try to think through like our referrals come in and I get background information on people. I try to make my checklist very specific to what I'm thinking as I see where the person lives and what their abilities are and what they're telling me they want to be able to do and what they can't do. So that I come in with a very specific checklist to ask and look at and check into before I start selecting things that we might wanna try. Next slide. So if smart home options, the things that I'm thinking about all the time, and you can mix these, you don't have to stick, like a smart home doesn't have to rely only on one method. Many times 
the strengths and what you're doing is that you're gonna pick a hub or a tool that allows you to use Zigbee and Wi-Fi and Z-Wave and Bluetooth so you can combine these things because then you're gonna know you have a network that has some backup plans built into it. So if one thing goes down, another thing will stay running. So I can look at AC power. And so that's like the electrical wiring that's already built into someone's home. And I can look at how things can be controlled, like lamps and radios can be controlled by touch lamps or by plugging into a control box, like an X10 unit, and then making that switch access for the person. So that's very simple. And sometimes that can be all that that person needs is to be able to have something that goes on and off and a consistent way to do it. And so that might be where I stop or it might be my backup plan, or it might be a partial fix. So I'll look at that. I'll look at infrared and that's any devices that are controlled like with an infrared signal to that appliance. So that often happens like with TVs or VCRs. Um, and so those are something where you aim at it and then it's controlled by the box. What confuses some people is like a lot of cable boxes will come with a remote and some are infrared and some are not. So if you're setting up something that relies on infrared, you need to know that you're using a remote that's infrared. And the way I test it is if I can turn the TV channel when I'm pointed at it, but when I'm pointed away from it, it doesn't do anything, then I know that I'm using an infrared remote. Radio control, and that's the kind of device that sends radio waves to a control unit, which then sends a message to that appliance that tells it, you know, turn on, turn off, like a garage door opener. So that kind of remote you can use within like two, uh, 500 to 200 feet, but you don't have to be in like direct, like in front of it, like you do with the TV. So the thing that you open a garage door opener with that's open and closed can also do power doors and can also do some other things in the person's home environment. Wi-Fi, so if the person does have Wi-Fi or hotspots, you can use that, especially if they have a really strong Wi-Fi and they don't have a lot of things connected to it already. Um, you can use that to control some things. I try not to use Wi-Fi to control everything. And then sometimes I we can plug directly into the inter internet with a hub to get more, more strength. So it just depends on what I want to control and what backup plans I want to have. I do like Zigbee and Z-Wave. You can get Zigbee and Z-Wave um, hubs, or you can get something that has one of their hubs built in. So I, a lot of times, will use um, the Alexa because it has a Zigbee hub built into it. So I have a backup plan built into my Alexa, which is using the Wi-Fi. But the Zigbee that's the hub that's in Alexa is using Zigbee. Z-Wave hubs, so you can get like a smart things hub or um, a smart home hub that has Z-Wave, Zigbee and Wi-Fi built in. So you have a lot of connectivity you can do with one hub. Next. Now we're gonna go into like how this fits with what the things you, that you're gonna be selecting are, so you can kind of see. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the smart home products today because you're gonna learn that later, but what I want you to learn is how these things connect because that helps you figure out your backup plan options and what you might need a backup for. Next slide. So I like to throw in low tech um, items, even if I am going to do a higher tech smart home and I know it can be supported, I do that so that I can kind of see how people like to have some technology, but I also like to do it because I want to have a backup plan for if some of the smart home higher tech things go down. So at Home Depot or Lowe's or any um, stores where you can get hardware or lamps or just very simple lamps, so not very expensive. Um, you can go expensive if you want, but um, most of the people I see want to keep moderate prices. Um, you can get lamps that are remote controlled. And so I have a lot of people who are in wheelchairs or using walkers or just can't get up to that lamp, might be like in a corner to be able to turn it on and off. 
But if they had a remote, they could do it. And the remote could be placed on a table. It could be Velcroed to a wheelchair. Um, I've had people Velcro it to spots where they can pull up. Um, and then that can be what you can turn on and off and dim light with. Um, and then those usually have batteries in them. So as long as the batteries are working, that's gonna work. I can also get something at those stores that make a lamp into a touch lamp so that the person can just get up to an area and touch it and that'll turn it on and off. Or I can get a motion sensor that I um, plug the light into if the person can make motion that turns that light on when they need to. Um, and then if it locks on and they make motion again when they want it to go off, I can do a lot of things like that. Um, those are great low tech solutions. I also sometimes will buy the timers because I have a lot of people in Minnesota, we get dark early in the winter and I have people that want a couple of lights on those motion sensors. So if they lose control of Alexa and their hue lights that they do have a couple of strategic lights that come on at a certain time. And then um, lighting a hallway to the bathroom and back or a critical place that can be dark at times, the person needs it to be lit up, but might be a backup plan or the only thing they need is low tech is I'll get some lights that are motion censored. And so as the person walks past it or wheels past it, the lights will go on. And as they walk or wheel past it, they go back off. Very simple, very low cost, but it can be a huge safety factor. Um, and it can really help somebody be able to get to the bathroom and back safely. A lot of people, including me, don't like to leave my lights on all night because it bothers me when I sleep and also my electric bill goes up. And so I see a lot of people who fall at night, but they don't know that there's these solutions to have light when they need it, but it can go back off so it's not staying on all night. And then I do use apps that are free that I can add to like the Apple home kit or, you know, whatever the person has, if they have Apple or Android, if they have a phone or a tablet, I'll look for some um, simple um, home modification apps that I can use to set up some simple smart tools to see how they do with them. Next one. And the other simple items are, there is an AbleNet Able power link, and that is for things that you just wanna plug into um, one port to do several things, you know, three to five things that you can put different switches um, for that to be able to control. And then the nice thing I like about the power link for a low tech solution is you can hit the switch for it to be on and off, you can latch it, you can have it be that um, the person has to hold on to something that lights up. I mean, I have a couple of people who want just certain things to only activate when they're holding on to it. So you can set a lot of different settings in that and it's very basic. I have a lot of um, people who use doorbell alerts or simple personal alert systems in the home. They might just be in different rooms than their PCA or caregiver and they don't need a high tech solution. So we will look at these um, low tech solutions of, and usually they're battery powered, they're wireless. Um, so they're very inexpensive. And like I said, I have a lot of people who will buy a doorbell but they won't use it as a doorbell, they'll put the chime alert in rooms that the caregiver might be and then the person has the doorbell that they can push the button of and alert someone and then they know to come. You can also, and we'll talk about Alexa in a minute, you can use the drop-in feature of some of those smart home tools if someone already has them or knows how to use them. Um, so on Alexa, you can drop into another room. So essentially it becomes your intercom. So you can then alert someone, but you can also tell them, hey, it's not a rush, but my laundry is ready. Can you go down and get it or things like that? I do use, like I said, X10s, which are using um, the, the protocol where you set each device that you plug into the wall is set on an A, B, C, D, one, two, three. And the matching thing you wanna turn on or off is set on the same frequency. So these then, a person with a switch or they can have a base that has multiple buttons to push would use that then to turn the things on and off that are plugged into these modules. So there are times that I still use that type of um, simple technology. Next slide. 
I also, um, if someone ha has a communication device, so I, ha I see a lot of people who use communication devices for um, being able to say what they want, need, or desire. We can set up environmental controls in smart homes through that device. Many of the um, speech generating devices, the higher tech ones have uh, environmental control smart home technology built into them. So I can see if that works for the person. They also have Alexa commands or Google Home commands built into some of them. So I can pivot off of that. I also can look at um, if someone has a new wheelchair, if they got the environmental control kit that goes with it, you can then access some of the environmental controls through that wheelchair. So if somebody really likes their joystick control, or if I'm involved in picking out their chair with them, um, they can either use their joystick or their head array or however they operate their wheelchair to control things in their environment if they get the right package that goes with their wheelchair. Again, those are high-end wheelchairs, but it's still something I want to consider. Because if somebody doesn't want a lot of extra devices and they're already learning some technology, if that technology has smart home capability in it, I'm going to look at that. Because some people do like it all built in one. Next page. I do use the Amazon Alexa a lot. I don't use Google Home as much. Um, and the reason that I use Amazon Alexa is that I like that I have a Zigbee hub built in. And that gives me another uh, way I can use the person's environment. And I also like the drop-in feature that I can use that intercom because I do have a lot of people that use that in their home or between homes. So I do like that feature that's available. And I do like all of the different ways I can modify the Amazon quickly and easily. So I like that it's ready, readily available and affordable and people can get it in many places. It's easy to integrate with a variety of environmental controls. Um, the list is really long of what it'll appear to. I know Google Home is too, so if you don't need the hub, many of you guys might be using Google Home. Um, it's very robust and, and it does have accurate speech recognition and it does learn a person's voice over time. So I do like that. Um, I do like to be able to optimize the settings, which you'll learn in another course to meet the person's needs. And it can be voice accessed or you can access it by touching on a tablet, on a phone, on an Echo Show. So there's a variety of ways that a person can physically access to turn things on and then also to use their voice. Um, you do need to be able to know how to set it up and know how to communicate with it because Alexa does a lot of things. And if the person has some memory and cognitive issues, there can be some confusion with the commands. And also if they can't hear the auditory feedback, you have to know how you can set up things so people get a light feedback on the top, like you see the blue. You can, for people that can't see where Alexa is and they can't hear that she woke up, I can also set that ring to help them know that she woke up and she's listening to someone or she's doing something. Um, and then, I wanna make sure that if I am using Alexa, I know that if the person doesn't have Wi-Fi, because it has a Zigbee hub, things that are Zigbee, I can set up where I have Wi-Fi and connect the Alexa to those Zigbee controls in another environment that has Wi-Fi. And then I can bring Alexa to a home that doesn't have internet if I've waited for it being connected at like my home or my office for 24 hours. I can bring it into a home that doesn't have internet and those Zigbee things can be controlled without Wi-Fi. Now you can't go to the cloud, you can't ask Alexa questions, but you can control an environment. Next slide. Um, so uh, local voice control is what it's called when you take this um, and set it up somewhere that has Wi-Fi and then you take it to someone's home then you're using local voice control and you can use that for your smart home for anything that's connected via Zigbee. Let, there's a lot of things you can do with Zigbee right now. So Hue bulbs come in Zigbee. Uh, many locks are controlled by Zigbee. 
uh, blinds. There's a lot of uh, motorized blinds that are controlled by Zigbee. So there's a lot of things that you can control that way that could be controlled after you've set it up where there's Wi-Fi and it stays connected for 24 hours that you could bring them to someone's house and they could control those Zigbee units. Next slide. So this just shows you that Alexa uses Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi plug, that's how she's communicating to a Wi-Fi plug. There's also Zigbee plugs and Alexa can connect to those too. So Wi-Fi plugs, I never use more than one or two Wi-Fi plugs in a home because when they become disconnected, they often don't reconnect very easily. And the person needs to, it's like a reconnecting mess. So the more Wi-Fi plugs you have, the more the person or their family is gonna have to go around when things become disconnected to figure out which of those got disconnected. And then they have to go through pairing it again. For the Zigbee ones, they, take, they do a really good job of staying connected and they don't rely on internet. So if the Wi-Fi goes down, Alexa will go down for the things that rely on the Wi-Fi, but the Zigbee plugs will stay connected to Alexa, to the hub and they'll still work. And if anything that Zigbee is connected to does go down and does affect it, the moment it comes back up, it'll reconnect again. Or you can unplug everything, plug it back in, and the Zigbee will find the Zigbee hub. Whereas the Wi-Fi plugs, no, not necessarily, mostly not. Next slide. That's local voice control. So you can see when I turn off the internet and you could try this at your home if you have Zigbee things. When you turn off the internet to Alexa, so you turn that button that turns the internet off. If you have internet, you can fake her into thinking you don't. And then you can see that you can still, you can try it. You can still control anything that's a Zigbee control. Next slide. Now, there are devices, I wanted to show you some basics just to educate you, not on the device today, but on the connectivity. There are devices that aren't in any other way right now but Wi-Fi. One is those um, doorbell uh, units that people use for video. So I have a lot of people that want to see who's at the door, wanting to talk to them, um, and, and do that before they let the person in. So that is going to rely on Wi-Fi unless you get it hardwired in. So, and even when you get it hardwired in, there's going to be a component of it that's going to need Wi-Fi for the video feed so that if they need to see them, they have that. So that right there, you know, you're going to need to pick something that does rely on some Wi-Fi. But I do it if the person does have Wi-Fi because it's worth it. It is the way that the person can see who's at the door and, and speak with them. Next one. Door locks can be Zigbee. They can be Z-Wave. They do have Wi-Fi door locks and Bluetooth door locks. I try not to use those because I want a door lock that's going to stay connected and keep working. So unless I have to, and I'll show you something in a minute for why I might think of it, I'm going to use Z-Wave or Zigbee or something that's going to stay connected to the hub that I have so that it is always something someone can lock and unlock. Next one. If someone lives in an apartment or they have, uh, they're renting a place and I can't have an installer come in to change the door lock, I have to leave the hardware as is, but I can only replace a piece of it if I replace the lock back in later, then I will consider this um, August door lock because this one, you don't change the integrity of the door. So someone can replace the old lock when they leave. And a lot of places where I have people that are renting require that. So then I will think of a Wi-Fi option if they have Wi-Fi, obviously, for the door lock. And this is a small one that doesn't change that integrity and can be put back. And so that person doesn't get a fine or, you know, they don't say no to these usually. Next slide. Thermostats, there's all different types of thermostats, but they do need Wi-Fi connectivity to communicate with um, what you are setting them up with. So those will require that the person has the ability to have Wi-Fi and you're gonna be putting in their password for Wi-Fi when you set that up. So these fool people a lot of times because you have an electrician that comes in or you have to electrically wire them, but they do need Wi-Fi too. Next one. 
Now I still use them, but it, you can't if the person doesn't have Wi-Fi. Next one. There are um, different controllers that can help someone to be able to get the water on and off. If someone has Wi-Fi, I will look at things that have Wi-Fi. And if they don't, then I might look at those um, just like sensors that you touch the faucet and it goes on, or you move your hands in front of the faucet and it goes on. And some of the motion sensors now, they'll put them on more closer to the person so they're not attached to the um, faucet itself. It could be moved so that it's more by where the person could wave their hands and then get their hands under the water. So sometimes we'll put those like in the front of the sink or to the side, wherever it's easier for that person to access it. Next slide. And then this is another one that you can do that is Zigbee. So lights, hue lights and many lights are Zigbee controlled or Z-Wave controlled. Now you have to be careful again because I do even some of my consultants that work for me will pick Wi-Fi ones by accident because a lot of these brands come in multiple options. So just really look to make sure you're lining up with what your hub is or with what you're trying to achieve. Um, and then there also are um, smart uh, plugs that you can use. So if people have a lamp I might not necessarily put a light bulb in it because that's going to cost more than getting a Zigbee um, smart plug. And then their light can turn on and off with their voice through the smart plug and they can use regular lights. Also, um, when people are looking at lights, I'm going to show you another option in a minute. Um, what you have to tell people if they have hue lights, um, if somebody, if those are for overhead and somebody uses the switch, like so they have a light switch. If the uh, family members use the light switch to turn the lights on and off, that can confuse Alexa. And so if Alexa all of a sudden is not turning that person's hue light on and off anymore, but it used to, then you need to make sure that the person or their family knows they have to go back to that light switch and then they have to put it back in on mode and then have Alexa find it again. So I do always educate people. A lot of people will want to make the choice to still use hue lights or some type of Zigbee light bulb for their above lights. But I just want them to know then that that could happen and it's not that Alexa's broken and that what they need to do to fix it. Next slide. This is called the third reality switch. So if someone's going to use overhead lights and you don't want to have a bunch of light bulbs, and they're okay with this, these fit over the light switch. And so they don't change the integrity of the light switch. You're taking off the plate in the front and you're putting this on over it. And those can be put back on later. So if the family or person is okay with that, then the family members can use the light switch. They just use this button and they push it on and off. It's using Zigbee and the lights go on and off for them. And then Alexa's hub is turning those on and off with Zigbee and it doesn't get confused. So it doesn't matter if the family use the switch, the um, hub still knows. So then there's no confusion like there is with the hue lights and the switch. Next one. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of like TV access, but it's important to know that, um, you know, with TVs, you're going to be looking at infrared for remotes and that um, there are a lot of different functions that if you're going to use uh, any other control to control the TV, that they're gonna need Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to be able to control it. And TVs are a lot more complex to control than one would think. And so that in your next session, you'll see that there's a lot of different choices you have, but you have to know things like this. Like, is the person just using TV? Do they have a regular TV? Is it an old TV or a new TV? Do they have a smart TV? Because sometimes smart TVs can give people voice control of, if not all, many of the things that they want to be able to do. Does the person have cable? And if they have cable, what type of cable? And you need to know a little bit about their cable box. So I always have someone give me the serial number off their cable box because I want to call the cable company and find out what their cable box uses to control the TV. Because whatever I am using has to be pivoting off what could control that cable box. And then if somebody has a sound bar or if they have other units in their home, like air conditioners that are controlled with a remote, 
there's different devices that I could use like this Harmony Hub to be able to control those. And the Harmony Hub will convert Wi-Fi and into uh, radio frequency and infrared. So it'll do a lot of different things. Um, the Harmony Hub is still out there and available right now. Word is that it's slowly going to be going away over the next two years, but right now we're still using them and they're still supported, but there's other TV options too. Um, but a lot of people don't remember to tell you that they're streaming their TV or they only have Netflix or they have a Fire TV. You need to know all of those things and you need to know what things they can't control now so you pick the right tool. Next one. Uh, the Fire Cube is just an example of there's something that's out there that this can control a, quite a bit of things for people. It's super easy to set up um, and it relies on infrared and um, Wi-Fi. But if the person has it, it doesn't have a huge database of things you can control. But what it does control, it controls well. And so I do have people look at that and try that and see if that'll meet their needs. Next one. And then uh, the Fire Stick is another thing that it can work with Alexa. The one thing that you need to know is it's Wi-Fi, but it also doesn't control everything. So it allows some basic functions with voice, um, but it's not gonna let the person control um, the all the volume, the power. It's not gonna let them navigate as much as they might want to, um, but it might. So it's, just, it's worth a try. Next one. There's going to be some devices that you're going to want to, um, or the person's going to want to control that you're going to need extra hubs for. Some of those are things like a fan. So that you're going to need to be able to use some radio frequency if the person has an overhead fan or a fan that's remote controlled to be able to operate. So we use the bond bridge as one that we've liked because it's easy to set up and it works with Alexa. Next one. Blinds are another one. You need to have a MyLink or a Bond Bridge for the um, mechanical blinds, the, the really nice roll up um, blinds and shades to work. Now there are a couple of motors that you can get to add to a blind or there's a couple of uh, blinds that are available in Zigbee. What you wanna do though, if you're gonna get a blind that either can stay with the person's blinds and it's just a motor or it's a Zigbee one that doesn't need a bridge. You just wanna make sure you look at the ratings of what that motor capability is for lifting the shade up and down because most people that are buying those are not doing it a lot. It might be for somebody for convenience, but the people that I see that need it, they are going to be using those every day. And so you wanna pick a motor and a control that doesn't break down because the person's doing the blinds every single day. Um, I just did a, a blind set, a, a set of blinds yesterday where I had the um, home modifier come in and they put the blinds up and that person has like a whole wall of windows in a room that he's in almost all day doing everything he needs to be able to do. And so he's going to be using those blinds with voice access every single day. Next slide. And then there's a devices where if someone can't control their hospital bed with um, their uh, controller anymore and they need to be able to do that with their voice or through their um, communication device, that you can set that up. And so with those, you need to know the make and model of the bed, can, the bed that the person has, the hospital bed. The person does have to have a remote that plugs into the bed so that the remote unplugs because then these devices that we use for customized bed control, they plug into that and then they allow, you can still have uh, control by someone with the remote, but then we can teach uh, the Alexa device or the AAC device to recognize these signals for the person to control their bed that way. Next one. We also can use this device um, is IR and it's used for um, AAC devices to be able to control the bed or to be able to control things like a lift chair. If someone wants to have some capability to control their lift chair, but they can't use the remote anymore. Next one. And then power doors. Um, a lot of times um, power doors, the person I see might have a progressive disability and they can't 
um, do the button anymore, can't do the um, get up to where the uh, door panel is where they push the button to get in and out. And so we are using like uh, different units to make that voice controlled. And that can be done at the time you're adding the power door, it can be done later. So getting a garage door opener and like we have vendors here that know how to set those up with the door. And then I pair it to Alexa for voice activation. Next slide. Okay, I got through, oh, and then that should just be me. I forgot to take off uh, Matt. <laughs> He's a, one of the vendors I work with here. Um, anyway, that got through really quick because I wanted to give you a couple minutes for questions. This just gives you a basic of all, like there's so much you have to think about. Um, and like I said, I create checklists uh, when I go out to do assessments. And then I create checklists once I get the person's equipment for the order that I'm gonna be setting things up on the smart home too. And one example is door locks. Once you set up a door lock to work with voice activation, then you can't, um, Alexa will find things that you set up if you um, don't have a door lock on it. And so like if I add a hue light bulb and I want Alexa to find it, I'll tell Alexa to discover new devices. And that's the easiest way to set up each new thing. But if I add the door lock too soon, she can't discover devices by voice anymore because that's a safety feature of having a lock. Once you add that code and you have a lock, then you have to do everything manually when you add in or you have to take the lock back off. So there is an order to how you set stuff up. And in order to build a, the right smart homes, you also just think of like any hubs you might need for what you want to control in the future. So just some pointers. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Sue. Yeah. Um, we're gonna give people a moment to be able to type something, any questions they might have into the chat or in the Q&A. And while we're doing that, I'm going to randomly select a winner from our participant list. And I've got Nancy Autumn, O-T-T-U-M. Nancy, are you there and are you are you excited to be able to uh, win a new Echo Dot? If you can, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and unmute. I'm here, what, what, what did I win exactly? Uh, we, we're gonna be sending you a new Echo Dot. Wow, cool. All right, awesome. Um, I'll go Thank ahead you. and- Thank you very much. If you, you're welcome. Go ahead and um, throw your email into the chat for me. Um, you can, well, I'll get it off of the registration list so you don't have to do that because I don't think you can uh, direct message me right now. But I will reach out to you and we'll get your address to be able to send that Echo Dot out to you. Thank you very much. All right, and it looks like we have two questions in the Q&A. Paul Spots asks, can you set up an Alexa in one place and move it set up? Can you take it somewhere else? Once it's set up, can you take it somewhere else and plug it in and still have the setting you set it up with? Yeah, you can do that. What you need to be able to do though is connect it. it, if, it if you're switching to a, a new place that has new Wi-Fi, then you need to reconnect it to that Wi-Fi. But then as long as you have um, the cell phone or the tablet that you use that has the Alexa app on it, or you log in to that Alexa account, if you move it, once you connect it to the internet, the only things you might have to reconnect are Wi-Fi based plugs or Wi-Fi based solutions. Everything else will start up. So Alexa will start up, the Zigbee things would start up, like all of those things would start up again. The Wi-Fi like little things that you do are the things you'd have to reconnect. They'd still be in the app, so it'd be easy to reconnect those theoretically. Great, thank you, Sue. Yeah, we have a lot of people that move and then we do that. So we have two more questions, but only two more minutes. So let's see if we can get okay. them in. <laughs> um, I have Michelle Rosado in the Q&A asking, do you have an idea of cost ranges for some of the different styles of hubs? Well, um, you know, we've done things for $50 that are really low tech to give somebody like four things they can turn on and off. Um, all the way up to the home I did yesterday was like 20,000 that they did, but he has a door opener 
um, power door opener and access to that with a voice, a lock, a ring doorbell, and he has lights that he can control in every room and he has uh, shades that he can control and he can control his TV and his sono. So he really can control almost his whole uh, main level when he's home alone, which he is all day. So that's kind of the ranges that I've been working in. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is from Yale Hagen. I'm gonna go ahead and unlock your ability to talk. Go ahead and ask your question, Yale. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering for loan libraries in California, who, who does the loan library? So who is your federal? Um, so like Minnesota Star is our federal loan library in Minnesota and I know every state has one. I'll go ahead. The funny I'll thing is ahead. I know the Minnesota one, I just can't figure out the California one and I'm from California. So. Oh, oh yeah. I'll go ahead and answer that and we've got to be quick because we are at 3.30. Yes. Um, it's, it's actually sourced out of us, out of Ability Tools. There are 12 device lending and demonstration centers across the state. Visit abilitytools.org which is, has just been dropped in the chat and you can look at the Device Learning and Demonstration Center's webpage to be able to find the one that's nearest to you. And they do ship across the state. So even if there isn't one very next to you, you can get items delivered to you. Thank you. That's helpful. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks everybody. All right, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and thank you Sue so much for coming and visiting with us and putting on such a wonderful presentation. Thanks, bye.